everyone. Happy Tuesday. Happy Ask an Expert Day. We are really excited for today's topic and guest. We're talking to Megan Brady, who's going to teach us about equine body mechanics. And I was just telling Megan, I know very little about this. <laughs> so my questions will be as a beginner. And I, I would guess that some people are beginners and some people have more knowledge on, around this subject. But for anybody who's here live, certainly do put your questions in the chat and Kinsey and I will get to those too. Um, and if you're here, just say hello and tell us where you're tuning in from. We would love to know who's here with us. And we're so glad that you're here with us. And Megan, we're especially glad that you're here with us. So thank you so much for taking the time to teach us about equine body mechanics today. Biomechanics. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm off to thank a great start. <laughs> um, so Megan, to start, will you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background and how you landed in the career and role that you're in today. Sure. So my name is Megan Brady. I'm an equine body work and equine biomechanics um, trainer. Um, and I have developed the somatic performance system for both horse and rider. Um, so interestingly enough, how I kind of got into all this is after college, I um, actually started working as a therapeutic riding instructor. So I was working with both adults and children um, with physical and mental handicaps um, and disabilities. And after years of doing that, um, I was really seeing the effects it was having on the horses. And so then I went back to school and got um, my certification and license for massage therapy and body work and physical therapy and developed my, my business working with horses um, in that field um, and then eventually getting into working with performance horses. I mostly work with um, dressage horses, horse and riders, um, eventers, jumpers, and jumpers. <laughs> That's, that's amazing. Uh, <laughs> version. <laughs> and so um, I've been doing this since 2010. Amazing. You've been doing the body work side of it since 2010? Wow. Yep. And where are you located and what does your day-to-day -day work look like? Are you doing all one-on-one -on -one client work? Um, so I'm located right now in Middleburg, Virginia, and then I spend my winters in Wellington, Florida. Um, so right now I work with individual horses, um, and then I do teach clinics, um, about once a month, all over the United States. And so I do travel a, a quite a bit to see, um, both one-on-one -on -one clients and both horse and riders and doing the clinics as well. That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot going on. Um, did you grow up as a rider? Are you still riding? Like what's your riding background? Yep. So I grew up riding. I grew up, I start taking lessons when I was, you know, five years old. My mom got a horse when I was three. And so I've been around them all my life. Um, I started in the hunter jumper world. And then when I was about um, 15, I got into into dressage. So I do, um, I live on a horse farm right now. Um, my significant other, he is a dressage trainer. And so we have 18 horses here and I ride about, I have my own horse, dressage horse, and I ride two other horses here. So I do still ride <laughs> quite, quite a lot. And then, um, I work the rest of the time. In the That's afternoons. amazing. You are every aspect horses. I love it. Yes. I've dedicated <laughs> my life to them. <laughs> totally. It's official. Um, yes. Megan is into horses. Uh, will you start by t defining biomechanics for us and what the practice really aims to do or, or what the body work that addresses biomechanics aims to do? Sure. So in the body work that I do, I, my first priority is aiming at the nervous system of the horse. So as we all know, horses are fight or flight animals and, um, they're mostly flight <laughs> and they are, um, 
prey animals. So that gets really triggered by even our interactions with them on a daily basis. So the first, my first goal is to access that parasympathetic nervous system and bringing their nervous system down. And then I can start um, manipulating the soft tissue because if they are not focused on me and if they are in um, not the parasympathetic drive of the nervous system, they are tense, tight, and they will never allow me to go in um, and soften that soft tissue, meaning muscle. Um, and so that's always my first job. And I like to teach my clients also how to do that. Um, because without that, then we cannot access the tissue. Um, it's very different than human massage or body work or whatever you want to call it. Um, I do a lot of manipulation of the limbs and focusing on the, the three major junctions of the horse, which is the pole, which is like the shoulder, shoulder girl junction, and then the sacrum. Interesting. So those, and, and is this work that every rider and every horse, well, every rider should like have in their toolbox to some extent, regardless of the horse that they have, or is yes. it more a, a knowledge base that will assist you if there are issues happening? Tell us about like, how, if it addresses you know, the everyday horse to help maintain, or if it kind of is more meant for addressing issues. Nope. It is definitely preventative care, as I like to say. So it's definitely, I recommend people getting on a regular schedule, at least monthly. Um, think of it as um, it's a building block. So as you as the horse gets used to it, you can go down to a deeper, deeper level each time and get actually really to the source of the dysfunction. Um, if there's dysfunction, if the horse is having dysfunction in their body, which they normally all do, we all do as humans, we all, none of us are balanced and horses are the same way. So there's always dysfunction there in some way. And the more consistent that they can be on, then the consistency of them being in balance is there. And then it's our job as a team. So I work on the ground and then it's my job to teach the rider and or the trainer how to keep that horse um, equal and balanced, relaxed, all the things that we want our horses to be. Yeah, absolutely. So Megan, can you talk about some of the differences between the work you're doing and like if you were to hand um, hire like an equine massage therapist or you you mentioned kind of what, like the the different procedures that you work on with the horses. What, are the, what does that actually look like in practice? So I have a several different certifications. So I have a, I have a your typical sports massage. Um, certification and license. Um, I'm certified in cranial sacral therapy, myofascial release, the master sim method, acupressure, um, and the list kind of goes on. Um, so, and nerve release as well. Um, so it looks different for every horse. So I can't really say, Hey, I go in and this is what a session looks like from the beginning to the end. Um, something that I do every single time is I have an evaluation every single time. So I want to see the horse go, meaning even if it's a straight line, just walking, I have to get a lot of history on the animal. And then from there, I, I will go to work. And depending on what the horses need and where they're at that day, that's what I do, if that makes sense. Because everybody, everybody has a different level of where they're, where they're at. So what I might do with one horse that day, the next session on the next horse is, might look so different because of what's going on with them and what they can both handle mentally, emotionally, and physically. Yeah. That because makes some a lot horses of are so shut down or they're so on guard because they are in pain that you have to address those horses way different than you do others. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, when you, when you talk to your clients and, and make recommendations to them, like I mentioned in my previous question about tools in our toolbox, like what mm -hmm. are tools that every rider or horse person could have in their toolbox 
I mean, I know you mentioned prior to when we were in the green room before this, <laughs> you mentioned mm -hmm. just like being a good, good at observing your horse and recognizing yeah. behaviors. So what are some tools, yeah. I mean, that included that you would recommend riders be aware of and consider kind of adding to their toolbox? So definitely just observation, you know, the first thing that I, um, you know, ask people is, you know, is there any change of behavior in their animal? And they're usually, you know, at the beginning, like, no, not really. And then I start asking more questions and they're like, oh, well, actually, yes, that is something that's been, um, you know, that's been happening that is new. So anything, you know, obviously there's the basic change of behavior, right? Like they're not eating, they're not pooping, they're not drinking, like that's one thing. But then the other side of that is, you know, how do they stand in the cross ties or when you're tacking up or how do they really stand in their stall? You know, are they, is one, one hind leg always resting and the other one never because that tells us something is, can they stand square? Um, do they naturally stand square or do they struggle standing square? Because that's also information as from my point of view, that gives me a lot of information because that means they're uncomfortable being square. And so, you know, if you're a dressage rider, you need to halt squarely in your tests. <laughs> so if they can't, that's a problem. <laughs> And sure, we can teach it under saddle, but if they can't do it naturally on the ground, there's some discomfort there that we need to address. Other things that I always ask people to do or just to notice, you know, is um, if you, you know, take a look at the side of your horse, you know, stand on the side, like, are they standing um, parked out or maybe with their hind end underneath them a little bit um, like they're on a pedestal? You know, that's all information for me to observe in their body. And sometimes, yes, they will do that for me when I go there. But if, um, you know, if if the owner can start um, really recognizing what the natural tendencies of their horse is, or if something is even changed, that gives me a lot of information when I go there to work with them. Um, another little tool that I always tell people to do is if you get, you're going to need a friend to help you, but if you can get your horse to sit, stand square and somebody hold their head straight, um, and then you stand behind your horse on a mounting block, make sure it's safe, obviously, and you can look at that view of your horse. So you're looking down on, around, like on his back. You can see the imbalance, if there's any imbalances in their body. Is the spine straight or is it crooked? Um, is the pelvis straight or do you see one side right side high or is their shoulders develop you know properly and equally those are so there's so little things that you can just do and start really noticing in your animal um also you know when the horses are releasing meaning like licking and chewing and yawning when do they start doing that do they do that when you're just in an one area grooming because, you know, I have clients, I'll be like, oh my God, they love it when I, you know, curry here. Well, that is even great information for, for me as a body worker to, to know. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I think that that is all, it all makes so much sense. And it's just making me realize how not observant I am because yeah. I, yeah, you're quick to just like brush things off as like, yeah, that's just how they are. That's just they um, are. That's just that. Yeah. We all do it. We all do yeah. it. <laughs> I do Absolutely. it with my own horses. Of course. We all do it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's only human. Um, yeah. Are there things that you recommend that, that people are doing like on the daily with their horse in order to improve just their general, like their general quality of life? Or like, are there things that as an amateur that I could do with my horse um, to maybe make them more comfortable? Um, well, clearly, you know, there, there's the obvious things, you know, good vet care, good farrier care, um, all those things. Um, I always say, you know, if you, if you find a good, you know, body worker in your area and try to get them on a schedule and when they get that, when you have your body worker come out, have them teach you some techniques, um, 
people are always wanting there's there's never enough does that make sense you there's always tech, techniques that you can learn to do for yourself or for the horse on your, for yourself um also there's a lot of um you know i run a couple facebook groups that we go through techniques to help um horse to help you and your horse and we can walk you through those things um because there's you know it's really hard for me to say this specific thing will help if you do this technique because we're they're all different and it's really hard to evaluate and make a blanket statement but um there are some things that you can um do to help with your horse, even relax in the cross ties. So start to notice um, what relaxes them, what, and I don't, I don't really mean after work because that's fatigue, you know, and so they're, they're naturally just kind of should be relaxed after work. Um, but there's lots of things that you can do on the ground with them as well. So they have, the two main centers of their nervous system are in their, in their, basically in their, um, underneath their shoulder girdle is the biggest one and in their sacrum. So if you actually just place your hand, um, like underneath the neck where the pectoral muscles are. So there's like a little bit of, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Crevice. If you put your hand there and put your hand on the withers, you can activate the nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. If you just put your hand, two hands there, one underneath and one at the wither, doesn't matter what side, and just literally take some deep breaths, not a lot of pressure. Your horse will take a deep breath and, and it's pretty amazing. And just that technique itself is a great one. Another one is you can just put your hand on top of his sacrum and you just take a couple deep breaths and they should bring their, their um, nervous system down. And just those, those two things can have a huge impact. That's so interesting. And it would be so rewarding to try that and see like the deep breath. <laughs> yeah. um, when, when, you have your hand like on their chest. Is it from the front, like from the front yes. between their two legs? Okay. Got it. Yes. Um, yeah. not where the girth is. Yeah. That's what I was curious. Okay. That's helpful. And then as far as like you, I'm sure you've seen so many clients over the years. Are there certain mm -hmm. clients that you're like, these horses are going to be in a better condition because they do X, Y, or Z, like, because the horse is, out on great turnout or, or they're doing hacks a lot or things like that, or is it less client specific? Nope. I think the best thing for horses is obviously I'm a huge fan of turnout, <laughs> huge fan. Um, so, and I know that some people are limited in that depending on where they are in the world, um, or the facility that they have, um, myself included when I'm in Florida, my horse does not get the turnout that he does in Virginia. That's just kind of life. So, um, so the biggest things that I see that, that we can kind of have control over is lots of walking, lots and lots of walking for warm up and cool down. Those are the some of the biggest things that we forget as riders is, you know, we get in, you know, we're short on time or whatever, you know, we just get on and we might walk a couple laps and then get right to work. And I always say the more walk work that you can do in the beginning and end of your ride, the better your horse will be for it. Um, from a strictly like from a body, body, physical and mental, you know, it's just, if you can just take that time in the beginning and end of your ride, I mean, ideally 15 minutes in the beginning. And I know that sounds like a lot and it could be just, and it could just be walk work too. You know, it doesn't have to be like walk on a long rain and hack, but it could, you can actually do some walk work, but the walk is so important and to their development and what they need both from a physical standpoint and mental standpoint. And then at the end of the ride for that cool down, that does so much recovery for the horse after 
you're, it's being written, it's amazing. And when that's skipped, when they go from working at a high capacity, both in, let's just say, both from a cardiovascular standpoint and from, you know, if they're doing dressage or jumping or whatever, you know, the, the fibers of those muscles are getting stretched or tightened or lengthened or whatever, they need that recovery. So it's so important. Um, and if you think about it, you wouldn't want to go run for an hour and then go lay in bed, <laughs> you know, like that would be really detrimental. And so when people, when horses don't get that, I see a lot of horses, muscles are in spasm. They have a harder time recovering after work, things like that. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. That's really helpful. So yeah. Megan, I know a lot of horses have back pain and like are just sensitive to the touch on their back. What are your general, like, I know it's hard when you don't know the exact case, but what are some mm -hmm. things that you recommend for horses with back pain? So there, there's, that's a lot of things. <laughs> so, you know, there's some horses that just have, you know, they're chronic back, they have chronic back pain. And so the first thing that you want to make sure that you're ruling out is there's nothing um, physiologically wrong with the animal. So really, you know, if you have a horse that is, has significant back pain a lot, you really want to get them checked out and make sure you get some x-rays on them, make sure that they don't have kissing spine, make sure that there's nothing ph um, physiologically wrong going on with them, um, to their structure. Um, and then, you know, you always want to look at saddle fit, um, things like that. You know, sometimes it can be just their horses, you know, they, they want to brace against, against the ride, against what they're doing in work. And, you know, a lot of that comes down to what's going on with them, you know, mentally as well. You know, if they are an internalizer, if they're one of those kind of nervous Nelly horses, you know, they kind of brace against that. Um, and even if they're good, they're good boys and girls, you know, they still hold that tension. Um, so, you want to be kind to their, to their back, um, when it comes to that. So being really cognizant of what the work is like as well. So, you know, if we, I, I, a strong believer as, even as a dressage rider of cross training, you know, we want to really mix it up. We don't want to ride five days of heavy work. You know, you want to be able to, have a warm up day, a stretch day under saddle. You want to have a harder work day. You want to go for hacks. You want to go working over Cavaletti. If you're a jumper, if you're a jumper, of course you're going to want to do flat work, not just jumping. You know it, that is really important to keep that variety in their life. And you want to try to think of like what works for you in your own training. If you go to the gym or if you do yoga or whatever your workout schedule is and you don't do the same thing every day. Um, and so that's not fair to them for either. Um, also something that I always want to talk about when it comes to working with our horses and working on our horses, whether that's something that you're learning or, um, they are not like people in terms of a lot of people when they get worked on, you'll hear like, oh, just get in there, get that knot out. Horses are not that way. <laughs> so if you think of it, they are so sensitive, they can feel a fly on them and they're trained to move away from pressure. So they, ha you have got to be able to, if you want to, you know, I see people go, oh, I'm going to work a little bit on my horse and massage this area. Don't think because they're big animals that the more pressure is better because the more pressure you give, first of all, they'll either go away from you because they're trained to move away for pressure or they'll brace against you, which is just tension versus tension. And that does not cause relaxation. So think of when you are even grooming, if they're ouchy, lighten it up. Everything lighter is always better with horses. And think about even when you're training them, you know, use the same, same philosophy. You want them to be sensitive off your aids, right? You don't want them to be, you don't want to have to like 
pony club kick them. You want them sensitive. And the same thing when you're working on them, if you, if you even just do those little techniques that I just said earlier, light is better. Lighter is always better. Does that make sense? That is really interesting. I wouldn't have, I did not know that. Um, because yeah, yeah, you see a 1200 pound animal, (laughs) it feels like there should be an adjustment to pressure there. Um, I want to address a question in the chat and then circle back to this, but going back to the walking discussion, Kara, Mm -hmm. hi Kara. Thank you for being here. (laughs) Um, Kara said, does the cool out walk count if you're still on their back? Does yes. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. So like any yeah. walking that you're doing, like your hacks, your, your walk before your ride. Your yeah. Like walk, sometimes, you know, when you're done stuff. riding, yeah, you're done riding. You might want to go for a walk outside if you're in the arena or just, you know, long rain, walk around, you know? Um, yes, that can definitely, they, you can be on their back. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Oh, we just lost Kinsey for anyone who's watching. <laughs> Kinsey's disappeared, yes. but that's okay. Um, I see her in the background actually still. So the question that I was going to ask along the lines of like more is not better for horses when it comes to pressure, are there other Mm -hmm. misconceptions around body work or biomechanics that you see coming up in a lot of your conversations with riders or the people that you work with? Yep. So definitely that's the number one misconception right there. Um, and so, um, I see a lot of people have, they have those, um, massage guns out, you know what I'm talking about? And so I am not a fan if you are not trained yeah. because people have that attitude, like more is better. And that is not the case. And you can actually do some really big damage to that. So if you do have one of those, I advise you to get trained on it if you're going to use it and, um, ask a professional, <laughs> um, and more is not better. Um, another misconception is that, um, they can just be fixed in one time, in one session. You know, I always say like, this is like, think of it like an onion. I can't just go in there and go in there and rip the bandaid off all the time. Like it is layer by layer. And something that happens with both horses and humans is if you go in too much, too quick, they go into what I call a healing crisis. And so if you go in there and undo too many things, too many compensations or too many restrictions that maybe they need at that moment because they're protecting themselves from something, you can actually make it worse. So this body work is a life, it's a lifetime thing that needs to be consistent Think of it like, let's just say you have a horse that's recovering from an injury. Let's just say suspensory because why not? Um, So let's say the horse was on stall rest for three months. Okay. And maybe it got hand walked or whatever, but it didn't have turnout. Just that thing alone, no turnout and compensating for an injury Though that horse has built up some compensation in their body and some restrictions that they actually need right now to protect that suspensory. Does that make sense? And so as the suspensory heals and he goes back into, you know, the rehab part of it where we're tack walking for, or, you know, and then we trot for two minutes and, you know, that whole protocol as that horse is getting back into condition, we need to be really aware of how it that time healing that suspensory, the compensations that have happened in their body. And so I think that is something that people don't understand a lot is it's yes, I'm, po- I'm pointing out an injury, but there's so many things that are happening in their body um, that are just compensating for something that maybe happened 10 years ago or at birth or whatever. And you can't undo it all because they will go into a healing crisis and you can make them worse, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, it does. It does make sense. And it's, it's so hard because like you can have the best intentions and not oh. necessarily. Yeah. <laughs> Which yeah, is an idea. Like you want, if you, you'd hope that if you have like it, it would all work out. Um, and also, hi, Krista. Thank you for coming. And I hope you had fun at Keegan's. <laughs> Just responding to people in the chat. Oh, hi, Courtney. Um, oh, no. Okay. Well, I'll stop getting distracted by the chat. And um, I'm just excited to to see a lot of you guys next week in Kentucky. At least um, say why you said, oh, no, though. <laughs> oh, well, Courtney said my job is really getting in the way of me listening tonight. And I said, oh, no to that. Um, <laughs> fair. Required. Yeah. Um, We're really inside Kinsey's head right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's you guys. It's been a long day. Um, okay, so what are your thoughts, Megan? Bringing it back here to the topic at hand, what are your thoughts on like stretching before or after or mm -hmm. ever with your horse? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of people do it, right? Um, I'm a big fan. You just want to make sure that you're doing it correctly because you can do more harm than good in certain situations. So it's, you know, I know a lot of people will stretch out the front legs after they're tacked on and things like that. And as long as you don't force the issue and you can manipulate that limb and the limb is relaxed and it is not pulling away from you or the horse isn't pulling away from you and you can relax that and in an active stretch like that, I'm all for it. Carrot it stretches, I'm all for. Okay. I love it. Is there anything you can do with the tail? Yeah, you can pull on it. That's what I was wondering. <laughs> um, so same thing goes for the tail as the legs, like as long as they're relaxed. And so with the tail, you know, sometimes you'll have horses that really want to clamp down. Do you know what I mean? Yes. And so if you take the base of the tail and just lift it up a little bit and have it, re if it, re if it is relaxed in your hand, does that make sense? Yeah, and totally. Right. Horses. Okay. Um, then you can wrap the hair around your hand it's easier to hold on to and you stand directly behind the horse and you just gently pull and what the horse will do is it will pull back okay so you're pulling at the tail and he's leaning forward and he's leaning into it and so the more he leans the more you pull and it's actually it's called traction so if you ever had any work done if you've ever been to a chiropractor or body worker or whatever and they they do that with your head it feels like they're lengthening your spine. The horse does the same thing. So the technique, though, is if you pull on the horse's tail and they back up into you, don't do it. They don't need it. Does that indicate like they're just not into it? It just means they don't need it. Oh, interesting. Um, also, nobody get kicked doing this, please. <laughs> we can yes. Please know the animal that you're yeah. doing this to. <laughs> They'll just um, randomly walk up to horses and pull on their tails, please. And you want to go straight back. There are some techniques where you can go side to side, but I would have somebody show you how to do those um, I because it gets into other other things. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I have so many questions. I guess I'll start <laughs> with what do you think about equipment that puts horses in a specific shape? whether it's side reins or I've seen butt bands used a lot. I have no idea how to use those. Um, will you talk about the equipment that you're like, this is equipment that I would never use or equipment that you're on the fence about? Just anything in that uh, genre. <laughs> Tell us what you think. Yep. So this is my opinion about equipment. Everything can be used incorrectly, right? Right. We can all, everything can be used to a point that it is not correct for the horse um, and the wear it's putting its body. Um, I am not a huge fan of equipment that forces them into things, forces them into a frame or puts them, you know, behind the vertical or things like that, because what's happening is from a from 
a body standpoint, they are not using the muscles correctly that are getting used. And so you are forcing activation on muscles that aren't ready to do that. Does that make sense? So I always say just if you have equipment that you use, so I have like something that I really like to use is um, the Equiband system. Have you seen that? That's the butt band, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm a big fan. Cool. I use it on my own horse. But again, you have to, this is about conditioning them and getting them ready to use it. You can't just go on there and put it on the, you know, a really tight way. They're not ready for that. So it's about conditioning them to it. Does that make sense? That's, I think it you makes sense. You don't want to put side reins on a three-year-old and yank right. them in because he doesn't know what he's doing in his own body. <laughs> yeah. What if you put side reins on a, you know, 10-year-old that, that is good on the flat and like, how do you feel about that? So my question always is, because I think sometimes when we fall into this trap of we just do things and I'm always like, okay, why are you doing it? What is the purpose for the side reins for you? Is it just something you've always done? And I, like so I, I'm curious, like, I actually haven't really used side reins much, but my thought mm -hmm. would be, and please, please myth bust this, but my thought would mm -hmm. be like, it could be a way to get the horse having even pressure on their mouth and in like on the vertical in a pretty like reliable way so that they're, I would think like potentially building even and correct muscles, but please do bust that myth. So my question would be like, yes, that's manipulating, let's say, the neck and the mm -hmm. frame, but what is the goal of that? At the end of the day, when we want a horse to be um, in a frame, we actually need it to be coming from the hind end and using his back correctly. So if we're just tying down their head, so to speak, yeah. in whatever way, are they really using their back? And that's something that you as the – the rider, the, the person lunging or whatever, like whatever you're doing, you have to be really, um, aware and intentional about that. And if, if you're using it correctly and getting the, getting the response that you want, does that make sense? It does. Yeah. So that's why like riding the horse correctly is better than just holding their face <laughs> in a certain spot, because then you can get them over their back using their hind end and, their neck is right. in the right spot. And please don't get me wrong. I lunge horses. You know what I mean? I'm a big fan of lunging, especially, you know, if it's, especially if it's a safety concern for, for people. Um, and of course that's how we teach the young ones. Right. Um, so it's not about the lunging and it's not necessarily about, um, equipment, it's about why are you using this and what is your purpose? And are you educated enough and have a good eye to know that they are working correctly in that? Does that make sense? Like, do you really know if your horse is through and using its back on the ground? Do you really know what that looks like? And if you don't, learn. Ask yeah. Them. Ask a trainer, you know, just ask, ask a professional. <laughs> yeah. Ask a ride IQ coach. <laughs> yeah. Um, exactly. yeah, perfect. So one of the questions we got is how do you know which type of therapy you should do for your horse? Like you mentioned all these different like certifications you have, like how do you know mm -hmm. what's right for your horse and um, kind of what program you should be on? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, there are, Cer just like people, right? Certain people like certain things, you know, certain people go to a chiropractor and they get a lot of benefit from that o over then, you know, maybe a massage therapist that does regular sports massage. And so I always say, you know, if you're out there looking to get um, help um, from a 
from a body work standpoint, um, you know, do your research on the professionals in your area, ask them lots of questions, ask them like what their certifications are. And it is a little bit up to the animal, you know, on what they want, have the person come out and you will know immediately if the horse likes it or not. And unfortunately, you know, I've had this experience with my own, my own animal, you know, where I really wanted him to get, um, acupuncture, um, so with needles and a vet has to do that. And I was like, I really want him to have this. And guess what? Nope. (laughs) He was like, "Uh uh-uh, no way. This isn't happening. And so, but that was something that I learned about him at a, when he was a when he was a lot younger and I even tried it as he got older and still the same way. So it is a little bit up to them. And, you know, I always tell people like, I know this sounds a little, um, um, silly, but see how the horse interacts with the, with the service provider and how, um, how they interact with the horse. It's truly no problem. There's dogs on all of these. (laughs) Um, that makes sense. What do you think about, I mean, I'm thinking about not therapies, but things that people have like, or have access to. So like aqua tread, um, or like the therapy blankets or those sorts of things. Are there any that you're like, that stand out to you as, you're you think are especially great or especially not worth people's time yeah again I, it does go back to a little bit how your horse you know responds to different things um i'm obviously a really you know you talk about um i'm a really big fan of the aqua tread um as long as it's used correctly you know don't overdo things like that um, I'm a big fan of the Theraplate. Um, I think that's a great thing, um, for the horses, um, all the blankets that are out there. So many, I love, um, red light therapy. I use that on my, myself and my horse. Um, I'm a big fan of that. Um, I know a lot of people like the Beamer blanket and there's the sports innovation blanket. And I don't think there's nothing out there that I've seen, um, in terms of the ones I just mentioned that, um, I'm like, no, you know, I think they all have a, some level of therapeutic value to it now, depending how much, I think it really kind of depends. Um, and we can go down that rabbit hole too. The things that I, that I, um, have stronger opinions about is, um, you know, some of the PEMF machines that are out there and the, the MagnaWave, and I'm not against them at all, but you just want to make sure that the service, the practitioner who's using it is well-educated. And that's my only advice on that. What kind of questions should you be asking to confirm that your therapist and make sure, like, make sure that they are qualified? Yeah, that's a great question. So unfortunately, here in the United States, there are no, um, to work on horses, um, there are no license. You don't need a license to do it. Like you need a vet or even a human. Like I'm a human massage therapist and body worker and I have a license. I had to take a board, um, you know, a board test. So with horses, unfortunately, there's not. I sit on a board of other professionals that we are working to try to change that so that there um, not anyone could just hang their hat and say, hey, I'm a body worker. Um, So we are trying to change that actually on a state level, on a nationwide level. So you really want to talk to them. If you're out there looking for a body worker, just ask them what kind, where they went to school, what kind of education did they have? How long was it? You know, the, unfortunately, there's courses out there right now that people can go online over a weekend, take an eight-hour course and call themselves a body worker or massage therapist. And I am – it is – not good. (laughs) So really find out, you know, what school they went to. If you're not familiar with the school, which, you know, a lot of people wouldn't be, 
Ask them how long it was. Ask them what they had to do. Make sure that they had case studies if they're newer. You know, ask always, you know, this is, I always say this is a, such a business that it is, um, you know, networking and it's ask other people about their work. If you're, you know, get a testimonial from them. Um, and then, you know, make sure that they have a good Edu basic education. And it's okay if people are still, you know, oh, I'm working on this other certification and this other certification and getting different modalities underneath their belt. But really, you know, making sure that they have the, knowing the fundamental anatomy of the horse and how they are with the animal is really important too. Because I, unfortunately, I have seen over the years some practitioners that, like I said, were um, a little rough. Sounds like the wild west out there, <laughs> but yeah, it is unfortunately, yeah. but, um, but I think if you do your due diligence and just ask them, you know, where their education is, ask them for referrals. You know, a lot of my business is referrals from trainers. Um, do veterinarians generally like, would that be a good source? Would you ever, if you have a great vet, would you ever be like, what body work practitioners yeah. do you recommend? Yeah, I would imagine. I mean, absolutely. That... I work with a lot of vets. Absolutely. I work oh. with a lot of vets. I work with a lot of farriers. I work with a lot of, you know, trainers that, um, and then if people want references, I can give them tons yeah. of references. And that's another way. Ask them for references. That makes sense. Um, I am curious about horses that like, if you look at their body, is there, do you see, is there like a most common area that is underdeveloped due to something that is wrong in a horse's body? Like, do you see, yep. does something stick out to you as like most often that you're seeing an issue in one area of the horse's body? And is it generally a result of how the horse is being ridden or is it often something that can be like helped along with Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest things that um, I see is an overdeveloped brachiocephalic muscle. So that's basically the underneck of the horse. And you'll even hear people talk about that a lot, trainers and riders. Oh, he, you know, he uses his underneck against me. You've heard that before, I'm sure. And so heard what's happening. And <laughs> yeah. And so if you notice there's a couple of things that can go on. So that can be really, it's overdeveloped. And then their trapezius muscle, which is right, the muscle like it, right in front of the shoulder, that will be underdeveloped. So they don't have basically a nice top line of their neck. And another thing that that will start to happen is if you look at their withers and you go forward towards their head. And if it dips down instead of a straight line, like it should, that's dysfunction. Interesting. And that is dysfunction usually typically in their, now I have to say this generally because I don't right. know, but without seeing individual horses, but that is dysfunction in their shoulder girdle and in the and that's where it's coming from. Now you can go down a rabbit hole and maybe it's a foot issue. You know, you can go down, it could be like, oh, this isn't developing because X, Y, Z, and then it goes down to like the root cause. But I would say that there, I have seen a lot of horses that have that overdeveloped brachiocephalic muscle and underdeveloped um, trapezius muscle. And a lot of it can be um, from incorrect training. Oh, got it. Okay. That's good to know. Incorrect training and then body work can help you get back on track. Yes. Probably. Yeah. Cause like at that yes. point, there's something that needs to be like helped so that you can start right. training more correctly. Right. So the horse has to learn. And the, when I say the horse, the muscle has to learn to get deactivated. Does that make sense? Relax. Yeah. And that muscle has to learn to get activated. And so what happens over time with our bodies as well, um, 
but horses, you know, they all that muscle, there's muscle memory in there. And so it's my job to say, okay, we're going to deactivate this and relax this brachiocephalic muscle. And we need to help the horse understand to activate this and start using its top line, start using his hind end correctly. Now he can, because I went in there, let's say, and helped undo the restrictions that might have been causing him to not being able to function correctly under saddle. Does that make sense? And then it's your job as the rider to keep him honest about that. Got it. Super helpful. Does that make sense? Yes, it it does. And Kinsey, I have a (laughs) follow-up. Usually Kinsey and I trade, but I'm curious if somebody's horse is having a hard time to one direction and it seems really hard to overcome. We've had this come up in a few, we have like video reviews with our coaches. We've had this come up in a few of them where like the horse will not keep the right lead canter or, or just generally is, is glaringly more difficult to one side or the other. Mm -hmm. How, How do you think through that when one of your clients shares that with you? So, okay. Or that's a great point. So a lot of things I need to see it go at that point, whether that's on a video, but I want to see it go naturally, meaning like rope halter, just no rider, see how he functions without that all tack rider influence, whatever, and see where his baseline is. And that's a really good indication for me because then I can start evaluating him on his own. Does that make sense? And if he yes. has a hard time, let's just say on the lunge line, even if it's, if it's a big, you know, a big, huge circle, that's half the arena. So we don't want to keep him in a tight, you know, tight, even like 20 meter. Um, and he s- still struggles. Then we know there's something going on in his body and we can eliminate the fact that like, okay, maybe it's saddle fit. Maybe it's something's pinching him. Maybe right. it's the rider influence. Maybe, you know, the list can go on, right? So, but if we can take some of the factors away and really evaluate that animal on his own to see where he naturally goes, then we can take a look at, okay, well, maybe, you know, he struggles with the right lead canner something might be going on in the left hind because that's his push off. Got it. That's so then we look at the push off. And so maybe he's struggling something, even hawk stifle up high in the sacrum area. Maybe he has a ton of restrictions. Maybe, you know, we can go down that rabbit hole, but that's the first thing that I have to look at from my perspective. Yeah. Um, to take out all the other factors and see the horse as he is on his own. Because if he then goes on the lunge line and can canter really nicely going to the right, then we know it's not, we know he's being influenced somewhere else. Totally. That would be great news. And also I'm sure the rider would be like, oh man, (laughs) but it would be great. It's also devastating. Yeah. Yes. (laughs) Okay, Megan, this, I mean, I can't believe we're almost here at the end of the hour, but this is a question that we love to ask um, all of our new guests. And I would love to hear from you just like, what is your favorite part about your job? Um, oh, that's a hard one. I love my job. Um, seeing the horse get more and more comfortable in his body and really working with people at like a team approach. I love that. That sounds incredibly fulfilling. Is the team usually usually like the ideal, the ideal team I'm guessing is like farrier vet client you. So that's trainer. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> the whole team. Yeah. Um, yeah. In my fulfilling. ideal world. And I, I am very fortunate because I do have this in my life and I have it with most of my clients is that I do get to work with like some of the top vets in the world. I get to work with some of the top farriers in the world. I get to work with some of the top trainers in the world and their clients. And that's really 
special. Yeah. That's amazing. I mean, there's, we've had some incredible people on this. I don't know if podcast is this event. And I mean, one hour, I'm just like, it is so fascinating. (laughs) So the fact that you get to like be around them and work together on horses is very cool. Uh, last, the last, last question is where Mm -hmm. can people find you online? Um, yeah. Where can they find you online? So my website is my equine solutions.com. Um, so, and then you, there's links there to my Facebook and Instagram. There you go. Easy as pie. Well, Megan, this was so help. I feel like it was so actionable and I hope that other people also (laughs) found it incredibly valuable. I'm sure they did. Like I said, I was at like a beginner stage. And so everything you said, I was like, helpful, helpful, helpful. (laughs) But I know that there, there was a lot there to pull out. So thank you for making this a value packed hour for all of us. My pleasure. And thank you for everyone who attended. Have a wonderful rest of your day or evening, wherever you are in the world. And we'll see you next week.